and then we'll go into question answer. Just one quick question, uh, Krishna Kolidi, is it okay if we record yeah. the, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's fine. It's good. It's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Okay, so my introduction. So I know you have given introduction. So let me say a few more words about who I am, because I probably have not met any of you. Uh, um, so I am Krishna Goy, and I graduated from Purdue in 2019. I joined in 2013. Um, during my time, I actually worked with two professors. Mostly, I uh, like for most part of my PhD, I worked with Professor. Alexandra Poltaseva in Dublin, and I graduated from her group. But in the very beginning, I did work uh, for a little bit with uh, Professor Yong Chen in uh, physics. So yeah, and then I I was heavily social during my time at Purdue. So I did do a lot of student organizations, and uh, Puts was one of them. And we uh, started kind of in 2015, so that was about two years into um, grad school that uh, kind of revival happened, and that's how we started. Uh, going into puts and this is actually from uh, one of the puts events where I had to give like a speech so I thought this is the um, a good introductory photo for uh, my profile and then um, yeah and then um, graduated in 2019 and then I have been at Intel ever since I have been uh, in Intel in uh, yield analysis but I did like two different roles in the four years Within yield analysis, the org is still the same, but uh, uh, but uh, two different types of roles. And we can, like, uh, I'll tell you more about that um, in some parts of the talk. Okay, so that's uh, that's my uh, brief introduction. Okay, so now uh, I will start with job hunting part because I know like uh, a lot of you are probably here at this point or going to be here soon. Uh, uh, and some of you are probably beyond this stage, but this is something like um, this is somewhere we start and we start to like uh, uh, think about uh, things while, while we are here. So hunting the job and uh, what do you do and where do you start and all of that process. So first, I would say that, uh, you know, when you start, start looking for a job, you need to start with um, a resume because that's literally the first thing that you would get asked. Um, or even if you have to communicate with somebody, you need to give them a resume. So you need to have a resume in hand when you are starting the whole process. And then it takes some time to build a good resume, but there you should be spending some time and make like a resume, which pretty much fits all of the, like it has the structure of all of the jobs that you're going after. Uh, of course, you will tailor it a little bit as you go into the process and you go into different roles, but it has to have a pretty holistic structure that you can just like, you know, send it out to multiple employers. Um, it should be simple, it should be short, but it should be impactful. It should not be like a very long resume because um, in industry and in any, anywhere, anywhere in the employers, mostly people are like, not giving that much time to read your resume. So you need to really bring out the key points that you want the employer or uh, whoever you are, you are going after to see. So um, having that uh, really come out in your resume is, is very important. And so keep it short and don't use like, uh, my, my tip would be, um, do not use a lot of different fonts or colors. So keep it simple, keep it easy to read, and keep like points that are um, uh, points that you that you want to get across very visible. And um, and then a second point is tailor it, meaning like there when you are going into applying jobs, there will be. Uh, some jobs where some skills are more important, where some other jobs where some other skills are more important. So you might have like a whole you know, list of skills that you have written in your resume. What you want to put first is what tailors that particular role the best. So you, you need to like make little modifications when you're actually applying and sending it uh, to people for specific, um, for specific roles. Okay, then uh, next is which companies are you going after or which roles are you going after? So this, the earliest you can decide that or uh, give it some more thought, it's the it's best for your uh, success in this process. Um, 
in the sense like you can go um, and apply and you know uh, go after like half hazardly in the different roles and uh, through a, through the process of interviewing you might realize oh this is really not what i want so you have wasted some of your time and you know um, effort into doing that so i think it's very very important to initially try to assess and this might change as you can as you kind of go into through the process but if you have um, um, if you if you can and if you have some exposure and a lot of lot of the grad grad students because you have doing you have been doing like um, you you have been doing some sort of out out uh, sort of like outsourcing activities and like interacting with different sectors of people academia industry whatever based on your um, research you might already have some idea and um, uh, because you have that like you have to bring it bring it all together and kind of assess like oh do i want like more um, a, a more research oriented role versus uh, you know i i want something that is uh, not like you're okay with something that is more development kind of a role a more engineering kind of a role uh, what kind of um, time or effort do you do you see yourself spending at the job and being happy with it those kind of assessments little things little thoughts about things will help you um, uh, decide the kind of uh, kind of companies you're going after as well as the kind of roles you're going after and that kind of brings me to the second uh, second point which i've written here like companies meaning are you going for like really big big companies or are you going for like something like startups and this this is where your passion your passion for working all that kind of comes comes in like are you really passionate about the work because oftentimes you would see in um, in startups you are um, you are um, you are having to put a lot lot more work and a lot more hours because um, because the expectation is such the expectation is because there are not that many people the 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 division of responsibilities are like bigger chunks are given to bigger people like uh, bigger chunks are given to individual people and you have to um, sort of see that project uh, from the start to the finish so that's sort of your responsibility and you own it and there's a lot of ownership or there's a lot of feeling of um, you know having higher impact if you're going into a startup uh, whereas uh, and you also will probably see a lot of growth in startup because uh, because the company is small you you might be like get you might get more visibility towards the higher management and all of that uh, but you have to assess that oh i need to be i need to be flexible i need to be putting more work into this and, and uh, more hours into this and all of that so this kind of also helps you should you um, um should you be open to startups or more open to uh, giant companies which are like big corporates because uh, the culture there is definitely a lot different okay so those are the first two and then there are two more two other parts of um, job hunting and third most third point and i think one of the really big takeaways uh, or one of the really big points that i would like you to take away from this uh, from for the hunting process is investing your time in getting refer referrals for uh, for your job and um, this doesn't uh, like this applies to like even if you're looking for internships or if you're looking for like full time jobs uh referrals are very 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 important uh in the job market since when i started and even now uh they go a long way companies really ask their employees to refer people cuz that gives them um that means they have to spend a uh, little less time going and looking for uh, you know candidates so they want uh, and they have a certain amount of sort of like uh, trust in the employees and so they really trust uh, the uh, referrals that are coming from the employees so and this is just like most most big companies have a system in place already to like internally refer people where um, uh, they take into account and they definitely look at the resumes there but also like uh, many times people can um, uh, directly write to a um, write to an individual hiring manager or something and refer you directly and this really like kind of sets you apart at the very beginning because 
um, your uh, is just um, sort of like a sure shot way of getting visibility uh, of your like into your resume. Like at least your resume would be picked up and looked up, uh, looked at. So that. That is something that often like people struggle with because you know you you go and apply into a pool of resumes and did they even look at my resume like that? So if you can send it via somebody or um, send it via employee referral, that really um, uh, that really really helps. And in this uh, point, I would say that um, you should um, you, you know invest time here uh, and try to build the connections. And even if you don't know somebody directly, it is still okay to ask them for a referral. And oftentimes you're like, oh, why are they gonna refer me? They don't even know me. It is, it is really true that why should they refer you? Like even that person is thinking, oh, should I refer that person? Because my um, sort of my thing is attached with your profile now. So to give them more trust about, you know, or more confidence about referring you, one of the things that I did, and uh, I have seen other people do also, you can ask that person, hey, can I like call up, call you up and we can discuss, you know, my interest. So I, so it gives you a better idea about what I'm looking for. And, you know, I can also learn about what's going on in this role. It's really like a really beneficial um, uh, communication there. Like you can learn about that person's role, which you are, um, kind of going after maybe. Um, and then that person uh, gets to know a little bit about your background and what you have done and how like what your profile is without having to sit and read through your um, um, sort of like deck of documents. And that uh, that that quickly gives, gives them that exposure, gives you that exposure. Um, and it could be a very, uh, very fruitful way of getting a referral. Um, do not get um, sort of demotivated if you don't hear back. Uh, because uh, uh, one thing I can tell you in industry is your inbox is always super, super full. And most of the time people are like super, super overworked. <laughs> so it's just very normal uh, to not, um, uh, you know, um, to not have the time or the energy or just kind of things to slide up, uh, slide through in your inbox and you're just not getting to it. It's not because you don't want to, you just don't have the bandwidth. It's it's a very normal uh, thing that happens. And so don't, uh, don't get discouraged uh, about it and just follow up and, you know, don't, don't be ashamed or, you know, this thing to like bug people. Uh, people like to get bugged because it shows that um, you're interested you'll be like, oh, why should I do it if she didn't ask me a second time? Or if you didn't ask me a second time, maybe they, they got something else. Like, so think about that and don't get discouraged. Um, do your research and your friend should be the LinkedIn app once you start applying because a lot of different things that uh, really come up in LinkedIn will be useful. Um, okay, and then, then finally comes to, are you ready to apply? Oh, once you're ready to apply, um, uh, there, there are really like two, three points here. One is um, you should apply as much as you can in your area, in your, um, in your profiles that you, have uh, um, that you have decided to go after, but you should also time it wisely. Like you should not um, go and apply uh, to your dream job at the very beginning, uh, because uh, even though you think that you are... Um, uh, fully prepared and you're like, oh, I'm just ready to go into an interview. It's always good to have a few or one or two at least uh, to kind of give you the real feel of, of things. Like when I went just like, oh yeah, I am, I am, I'm really like, I can do it easily. But the first ones were like, I was pretty, like, I was pretty bad at it. Like, it's just the, um, it's just the starting process and you just don't know a lot of things. So it's it's always good to keep a low stake, few low stakes, low stake ones at the very beginning. So you just get like a real feel of things. And then also like for many of the for many of the jobs, you really need to um, like start preparing. Like I know that from some of my other friends, uh, it's not so much true in my area, but some of the other friends who work in softwares or developing and coding kind of roles where you have to like go to um, Few, few rounds of rigorous coding process. Like this is like literally the, 
sort of screening process. So you have to go through those before you go into an interview where they're really judging you for you and not judging you for your like basic coding skills. So you need to give yourself that time to prepare. So when once you're applying, just start preparing. Because once you start getting the call, you probably not have the time to go back and study and prepare. So it's always um, good to like, you know, align those things um, um, in that time zone. Okay. Um, how am I doing on time? Sorry. I know that we want to do 45 minutes. Oh, it, it, it's fine. It's fine. You can carry on. Like, okay. It's cool. fine. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Okay. So, so then, then comes the interview days or the interview day. And this interview day, what I'm talking about is really the interview day after you have gone through your basic, um, uh, you know, screening rounds of interview. Like it's it's not really um, an in every interview because every like job roles have kind of different kinds of interviews. So I'm talking about like not not those which are like very intensive of you showing a certain skill because those are like some in some cases the very initial rounds, and then you go into like you know talking to more like people like specific teams that are going to hire you or um, talking more about what you have done in your other skills. So I'm talking about that interview because those the previous ones are really like you, you prepping well enough and going and delivering and showing that you can solve the equation and write the code. So that's, that's, that's separate. Um, coming to your interview day where you are really talking to a team where you are going into or you are envisioning that you're, you're, you're going into that team. In those interviews, I would say these are the three things that you really, really, really need to remember. What matters the most is your attitude that you bring in on the interview day. Companies are, uh, if, you're, if you're coming from grad school like Purdue and you have gone to grad school and you are coming with a PhD, companies are pretty sure that you are a good candidate who can learn a lot of things and deliver a lot of things. They're not oftentimes looking for an exact match of your PhD research to what they're going to do in the, in the industry. Because a lot of the times what you are doing in the research is not what the industry is doing. So they're not, be, they're not gonna be like, oh, how did you do this? Explain to us. This is not really the most important thing. They're trying to understand whether or not you have the correct attitude to uh, work in a very diverse kind of a team and learn quickly, adapt quickly to the culture and bring in your problem solving abilities. So that's like you in an industry, most of the time you will be um, faced with different kinds of problem statements, something that you have not encountered before, something not something something that you have not solved in your PhD thesis before. And they want you to see if you can bring in your creativity into those situations. So it's the attitude that, yeah, I can do it. And the aptitude that, hey, I can learn and I can deliver. That's the really most important thing. And that's what they are mostly looking for when they're asking you questions, uh, aptitude questions that, oh, hey, I'm gonna give you an example of this, this, this scenario. How would you react in this scenario? That's what they're looking for. They're looking for your attitude and they're looking for your aptitude of problem solving. So that's the most, the most important in my opinion. And then the other thing is asking questions because you really wanna stand out to the interviewer because that, that interviewer is gonna uh, interview you in that day and probably gonna do so many other things. He's just like, you're probably like, 5% of his whole day. And then he's gonna do it for like several days. And at the end, he's gonna like, he's gonna have to remember you. So the only, or not only, but like one of the ways you can really stand out is by asking questions. Many times people say that, no, I don't really have any questions. But even if you don't have any questions, make up a question and ask, I would say. Cause then that would really, sometimes it would make the interviewer think about the answer and they'd be like, oh, that was a good question or that was a question that I had to answer. 
and it also gives you the opportunity at that point to utilize that to learn about that team the work the culture all of that is going to be really important once you go into the um, into the workplace so use that opportunity and you will probably be interviewing with 10 people in one day you have to ask one question to each of one of them and you can repeat it they're not going to talk to each other so you can have the same question ask again and again so that works um and i did that too like i didn't have the same i didn't have like 10 different questions um the fi final and uh, of course the other most important is relax i know it's like cliche sounds cliche that how do you relax but uh, i can tell you that uh, by the end of like if you have 10 interviews lined up in one day like with 10 different people after 5 you're a lot relaxed because you're like yeah i have said this like a thousand times now i can say it one thousand more times so uh, you will be relaxed but um to remind yourself to get relaxed that's important and that's because one thing i want you to remember is um when you're talking about your work or you're explaining how you did something like this or how you um you know um how you uh, overcome a problem um uh, any of that you should always remember that you know it best nobody knows your research your experience what you have done what you have achieved more than you have and you have to bring it forward and you have to like give them that that you you own it and the other thing the, the final thing is that um you don't always have to know the answer and this i can tell you from my experience which i have successfully got an offer from and have told on several questions that i don't know but i didn't just say oh i don't know like it's okay to not know but it's oh, you have to like put it like oh i'm going to try to answer this like okay i cannot fully maybe answer this but let me try let me show you how i would approach this if i did not know the answer and again like that kind of goes back to the first point that you have to be like you have a problem you try to solve it you show that aptitude and show that attitude that you have have a way or you are thinking about solving the problem and not just like throwing your hands in the air and be like okay i don't know but it's okay to not know like not having an answer or saying a wrong answer is really not the make or break um of an interview ever um okay so i think i covered most of the things i wanted to say here yeah and just like come out as like you know a positive uh, bring your positive um, outlook smile be relaxed be friendly that helps um, and the other thing is uh, um, if you have in your resume if you have leadership or if you have um, you know you have done some specific problems it's good to have examples ready it's good to have um uh, you know a few lines to say uh, about uh, different experiences that you have and i'm saying this again from my own experience that you get asked to give an example several times or oh, can you give an examples of how you did this or can you give an example of um how, a challenging situation that you came across in phd and what you did to overcome that it's a very kind of a common question um or or you know several variations of this so have some examples of difficult scenarios uh, creative uh, creative solutions that you have gone through um and all of that and just like have one or two lines to say uh the um only other thing is um if if something is on your resume it's a fair game to ask and often times when we're writing resume we just like to fluff things a little bit just okay i just did this but yeah it can go inside my resume like okay i just you know did it one day but it's okay to say it because it fits the profile um it's okay to do that but know that you have written it and because you might suddenly be like asked oh you did this what did you do with it so have at least one line that you can say about um how you did this what you did just don't get surprised for about things that are on your resume so those are um those are some of the the things that you would i i would think remember for your interview um interview day and it will be a long day and just go through it with the best uh, way that you can <laughs> okay um okay so once you've gone through all of that 
uh, brings you to this um, point of would you say yes or would you say no? Um, first of all, I would say that you don't have to say yes. Um, it's not like you have to jump on the first job you land. It's very important to know that. Because remember when I said that one or start with a one or two low stake ones, you might land those jobs and you be like, oh man, now I have the job. Should I just like, you know, not take it? What if I don't get another one? Don't get into that. If it's not, if it's your first job, second job, it's, and you're not like, oh, you just, you're not totally sure about going into that profile or that role and you have other things lined up for you, you don't have to say yes, just because that's your first second offer. So um, be mindful of not being, not jumping on the, on the first one. So that's the first point here. Next point here is um, to be cognizant of whether you are being pushed for a decision or being pursued for a de decision. And uh, this will often come from the employer who has given you an offer uh, and be like, oh, can you please let us know within like five days? Don't do that. It, you, and I think, uh, I think in Purdue's, um, they have this, uh, they have this cell for, uh, what is it called? Basically a career development cell which they will also tell you that the employers are required to uh, give you 10 days of making that decision. So if you're given less than 10 days, go and ask for uh, more days. You, even if you have made a decision, you can still ask. Like, take that time and be like, oh no, I'm not like sitting here um, giving an answer within a day. So uh, don't get um, don't get pushed into giving an answer within like less than seven days for sure not. Um, so definitely ask for extension and they will give you that extension because they know they're supposed to give you the extension. But of course, you know, like if they if they can get you to say yes within a day, it's good for them. So initially they'll be like, oh, can you please let us know like within a few days? Uh, don't fall into that. Pursued, you might be pursued by an employer and um, heavily pursued, which is another way of getting pushed. Um, um, and this is a very real situation that can happen and often can happen. And it kind of becomes into a more real uh, difficult situation when it is not your like number one job that you're going after. You're being pursued, but you're also trying for another job which you'd rather go after if you get it. So if you are into this kind of situations, a situation where you're really heavily being pursued by an employer, where you're not sure, I would say in those cases, get some, um, get some opinion from people, consult uh, with people who are in the industry, who are a little experienced, they can give you some more insights versus in like, you know, what, um, um, should you go for that employer or not? Like, and that's like, of course, like you would have some um, understanding of why you would or not want to go there, but it's also like can be very helpful um, to talk to somebody who has um, who has some more experience either in that industry or that role or that employer. So any alumni that you can think of or professors who might know about that employer, all of that is great resource to kind of tap into if you are being heavily pursued. Um, so um, keep that in mind because can happen and um, uh, it, it, it can be like very pressurizing a situation to give an answer. Um, third one, very important. And uh, you will ask a lot of questions and this will get like heavily discussed in many different forums. Don't be afraid to negotiate your offer. Um, it's very important because we are, we often think that uh, going out of college, we are sort of in a um, like less powerful role where we are trying to negotiate our offer. Be like, oh, why would they negotiate with us? Or they're probably gonna say no. And uh, I have seen this play out in all different ways. And the first thing to know is it doesn't hurt to ask. Just because you negotiated, they're not gonna withdraw the offer. 
it just never happens. It's just like, it's just a scenario that will never come uh, alive that, oh, because you asked for something, they're gonna, oh no, this is now your offer is canceled. Like it's not gonna happen, but you can gain a lot from negotiating. First of all, it will give you a lot of confidence boost if it, if it is uh, met with an yes. So that's really good. The second is um, um, you should know that you are at this table and you can ask this question to the employer because you have something to offer that they really want. So bring in that. And it, of course, for negotiation, it really helps if you have other competing offers. So if you have, if you can line up interviews like that, and if you have uh, competing offers from one or two different companies of similar stature or similar roles, and you can be like, oh, you know, I don't have to go for this. Like I can always go for this if they are giving me, um, uh, giving me, paying me more just for the lack of, um, for, for the most obvious example would be if they're paying me more for the same job and giving me, um, very uh, similar profile, I can always go with them. Like, and uh, so those are like really great situations where you can um, uh, you can bring in negotiation and it can be met with an yes. Um, again, with uh, maybe with startups and um, uh, bigger companies, they look, the nego negotiation might look different, uh, uh, but in both situations can be, uh, can be very, um, uh, useful. Um, uh, for example, one of the things that um, is a good negotiation point is remote working. Um, it's uh, remote working, having more benefits in the sense like one is base salary, um, whatever your base salary is, you can negotiate that. You can negotiate uh, getting more bonus, you can getting more equities in the company, all of that. And depending on the companies, um, many times I have seen even the same companies, it doesn't even matter uh, if you hear from person A that, oh, hey, I went into this and I tried to negotiate and they didn't negotiate. That's not even a good reason for you to not negotiate because really it depends on the teams. It depends on the orgs a lot. Um, and in my case, uh, I negotiated and I was met with a no. Um, but uh, in the same company, my, when my husband did, um, he negotiated and he was met with him. Yes, it's the same company, different orgs. So don't read too much into it. Do your own thing. Make it your own journey. Um, it's definitely ask politely. And if you have some must have criteria, like if you have um, something that you really want, um, uh, you, you must say that ahead uh, and be like, this is my must have. Otherwise, I have to walk away like for example, again, remote work. This could be something that you really have to, uh, and this would be important for the company to know because they might have to adjust your whole base salary based on uh, where you work or not. So that's something to think about. Uh, second, last point is commitment. Um, Oh, yeah, once you have said yes, um, a lot of people think that, oh, can I just like go back and say no? Uh, usually not something anybody would recommend. And that's because, you know, everything kinds of kind of um, tie in together at this point. Like somebody who has referred you, uh, you have like built all these connections and you have said yes. Several months later, if you say no, the company or the or the team has to restart that entire process. So they really take this seriously and be like, they really don't want that. Like, and if you're coming back to the company in a few years and coming back to the same team, it could hurt you. I, I'm saying people, I'm not saying that people take it personally. It's almost never like taken personally. And if you, the, if you are going to have to um, sort of say no to that offer, the earlier you can do that, the best for you and also for the company. That way you will burn less bridges. So um, whether whether it is, um, while it is not an absolute not no thing to do, but it better be avoided. That much I can say. Okay. Uh, but uh, the, the only last point and kind of my um, uh, two cents here, I would say is 
it's important to get your foot in the door, meaning uh, get inside the industry. Like even if you are not getting, you have tried and you're in situations where you're not getting the exact role or the exact position that you are after, it's not always that, like it's not the end of the, it's not the end of the road for you. It's really the beginning of the road. And really a lot of opportunities open up once you have experience. Industry experience is really valued in industry. You would, you would see that and you would hear that. And if you like follow people a little bit in their career, you would see that um, a lot of in, oh, industries are ready to interview you once you're not an RCG, RCG meaning recent college graduate, once you have like two years experience of working in company A, you just might become much more relevant to the company. So to have an experience in industry is valuable. So if you're not getting an exact match, uh, don't get deserted. It still is a useful experience for you. And you will probably, it's probably like a step up from where you are uh, to where you want to go. Okay. Talked a lot. Okay. Um, next is the trail guide. This is my uh, fun, fun part. Uh, the corporate trail guide, where I'm going to give you tips of how to navigate the corporate woods. Okay. Few points here. Again, um, first one is do not just learn the job, learn the culture. Meaning, um, all of you, like coming from your backgrounds and your like, you know, uh, stellar academic careers you are all very fit to do the job pretty much when you're going into it. So you learn the job. It's, it's impossible that you not learn the job. What will really help you in the long run is learning the culture. And when I say that, um, uh, uh, let me clarify, like every company, every team, even within a company, every organization or even every team have a certain way of working like, uh, what uh, what is really appreciated how how are things done and uh, what gets you into the game more what gives you visibility um, all that is sort of the culture the faster you learn that the faster you will be able to effectively use that for your benefit or for your um, growth whatever you're looking for in that job so it's very important to be cognizant of what's going on around you, how things are working and observe that and learn that the sooner you can. Um, second is three very important things kind of put together in one point, teamwork, proactivity and communication. Teamwork is something that, you know, like it's probably the most used and the most talked about soft skill ever. And it's really, really, really very, very important. Like for you also, like once you go and work in a team, you would realize that if other colleagues are not really good team players, it, it really hurts you too. So being a team player, learning how to be a good team player is, is important because in many times in corporate and probably most times you will be not solely responsible, like you will not be the one person team for anything. Like they want productivity, they want things to be done faster. So you will always have a few other people working on the same thing with you. And that, that really is something companies value because they want that sort of diverse uh, background mindset, creativity come into this solving this problem. They want other people, like not one person's thought, they want five person's thought, five people thought to come solve something. So once you're in that, you have to really make use of that and also give back the same way. Meaning um, like you will need help from others in your career, like in your growth, in your um, uh, time at the industry, but you also should be the same a helping hand, same person giving back to the team. This is where you will make connections that will really last you a lifetime, where you are making good teammates and you are being a good teammate. One of the things that I have realized initially, if you don't have good teammates, it's really a difficult situation to work in. It's more like it's ineffective, you are stressed, it's not a good situation. So 
you, and a lot of you probably would be going into something like that and you realize that yourself so once you like so if you are in that just try to be you know a better version than that and uh, once you're getting help one of the thing is to like you know credit give credit to people where it is due uh, a lot of the times people are like people don't do that it doesn't come naturally it's all me that's not very good um proactivity proactivity is almost always across the companies across industries across fields uh is something that is valued everywhere meaning if somebody is jumping on taking something they are noticed they are given that um so you have to be proactive to take more responsibility to like be like oh hey i want to do this can you put me in this can you help me do this or i want to learn this i, I want to contribute this is almost always probably like 9 100% of the time taken as a positive attribute at, attribute not always you would be like oh yes you can do it but you should show that you are eager you're eager and this uh, not just showing that but that's also brings in lot more opportunities for you nobody or not nobody but many times uh, uh, most times opportunities are given to those who ask and kind of the ones that are not asking are forgotten They're not just because um not just because um they don't like you or something like that it's just because uh somebody who is giving up the responsibilities are dealing with a lot and if you are putting yourself out there it's easy for you to uh, easy for me to give it to you um and see how you do and the more you do things the more you learn and the better you do and it all works out in the end so proactivity is almost like not almost always always a good thing in um in any sort of industry it doesn't even matter this industry or um, any other industry the third most important thing is communication set up clear communication it and cannot be overemphasized and you learn this as you and i feel like i'm still learning like uh, almost going to be 4 years and i i feel like i still have to remember to communicate properly effectively without ambiguity um and those are just it's very subtle but they make a difference like for example i would tell you um saying i think this is true is not very effective you say i know this is true or this is true such such and such thing is true we always many times we're like oh i think i think it may be like the, this kind of ambiguous languages are not great doesn't show that you're confident it doesn't show that you know you are um, you are you know the whole thing so gives you less uh, like gives less confidence in your whatever you are saying and once you keep doing this and i feel like we get into this habit of saying i think it may be like all kinds of like dubious languages um so it just comes and some other people would be like not doing that so they would just appear like oh they know a lot versus you like oh you probably know a lot but probably not like that's that sort of a distinction will be made so have have like co- like be cognizant about some some subtle things like that clear communication with your co- colleagues um to handle um you know difficult situations managers <laughs> managers can be a very um, you know sweet spot and a kind of a hit or miss um, situation which is completely outside of your control once you're going into the team like you you don't choose your manager it, uh, it might be a great manager it might not be a great manager um i have had experiences with not so great manager and um okay managers so it's it's in those situations or even not so great teammates and great teammates in those not so great managers not so great teammates not so helpful managers not so helpful teammates the only way you can uh, sort of keep doing what you're doing and keep your um, keep growing in your space is if you practice communication and it's it's not it doesn't come naturally you have to do it again and again you have to be like oh let me clarify let me let me set let us set the expectations um of what where we want to go where we want to see what you expect out of me all of those talking about things 
helps a lot. Um, the other thing about communication is saying, owning what you do, like don't undersell yourself. Um, don't say that, yeah, I have done it, but you know, when I'm saying that give credit, give credit clearly, but also take credit for what you have done. Like don't let others take away credit from you and sell your, don't sell yourself short. Um, speak up, speaking up always is a good thing, I feel, in my opinion. Um, I don't think I practice it enough and I have to remind myself to do that. You don't have to know 100% of something to speak up or to ask a question. You shouldn't be like, and I feel like in my observation, a lot of the time women do this. They want to know everything. They want to be sure. They want to be like, oh, do I, um, you know, can I, can I go learn this on my, on, by myself on the side? And then I'll come ask the question. It's sort of like an inherent thing, um, kind of a character thing in my observation. Again, not to generalize, but it's just my observation. Uh, so be aware of this and try to step out of this. You don't have to know a whole lot. You don't have to learn everything by yourself. You can still ask the question. You can still share your input and uh, be outspoken. It gives you the it, it gives you visibility. Um, and there, there are no dumb questions. So um, ask away. So those are my uh, three main points of um, how to navigate your team, how to really get the best out of it. Um, you decide your pace. A lot, lot will be talked about once you go inside the company. A lot, lot of the times, a lot of the talk is about growth. Um, and it's pretty much like overused um, and overemphasized a point. Uh, once you go inside, like just as you start your career, from day one, you don't have to start about growth. You don't have to think about growth. You, you can think about learning the culture first and then decide about the growth. And the more you learn about the culture, the more you learn about the job, it will help you to decide your growth pace like how you want to grow in the in this company or in this organization or in this team. Do you want to go like vertically up? Do you want to go laterally, like, you know, widen your scope and be the master of some skill? All of that. And don't just copy somebody else's growth. Be like, oh, he joined two years ago, four years down the line, he's the team lead. Don't do that. Do not try to like be like, oh, I joined this year. I have to be the team lead six and four years down the line it's it's really not very effective you decide as you like the work like as you start doing the work you can decide how you want to uh, pace yourself and it's okay to slow down it's okay to like you know some years you're going to be like okay I just want to like you know really spend a lot of things into this growth space the other another year you may be like oh no I don't I don't want to I just want to like widen my thing I just want to like deepen my understanding and that's totally fine and I have seen like successes come out of both sides. So it's, it's, it's really not that one is better than the other. One more thing is the, that to like periodically assess with yourself, are you on track? Uh, and are you on track, meaning are you on track with your sort of goal in career? And uh, like you will not know this at the very beginning of your career when you're going into the, you might think that you know, but it will really evolve. Like the more you are doing, the more you are like learning how things are working, how different job roles are and all of that, you might like completely reinvent this goal that you have, like where do you want to see yourself? Uh, and it doesn't have to be like, oh, why do I want to see myself 10 years down the line? Uh, it can be like five years down the line, something short term. And like periodically check with yourself that what you are doing or um, is that aligning with where you're going or like uh, the one of the things that can give you really like on perspective into that is looking at your peers or your senior colleagues who have been on this on this group or doing the same kind of work for a few years you can check in to see where they have gone where they were you can talk to them and decide for yourself that whether where you want to go or you uh, you are being served or not like for example in my case um, when i joined intel 
and I, when I interviewed with this particular team, uh, they, they, they had given me um, three different kind of sub roles to choose from. Um, and I, um, I was very sure of a certain one and I picked that one. Uh, well, they didn't really give me to choose from, but they said that they have like three different types of roles. And um, yeah, they said, oh, if you like one over the other, please let us know. And I was very vocal in letting them know, hey, I want this option B or the type B role. Because I was very sure that I really want to do this. Um, and I would be the happiest and this is like my thing and all of that. Once I got into it, after after like a year, I was not liking it. And even though I was very sure, and it's not something that, you know, I just invented and be like, I didn't know anything about. I really knew the kind of stuff they were doing or the what the job entails. I knew all of that because I had like kind of very similar um, experience for a long time. So, uh, but even then once I went inside of this and I, I just didn't like it and there were multiple factors to it. Uh, I felt like um, this is not gonna serve me to where I want to see myself or this is like not serving me to the kind of impact I want my work to make. Like I'm not getting enough visibility and all of that. If you do think like it's not meeting some of that, it's not going, for where you want to go, you feeling that you are uh, you are not gonna grow in this, or even whatever new skills you are going to add is not gonna serve you in the long run. Avoid that situation, meaning you can step out of that situation. It's okay to decide to get out of that and move to a different role, move to a different team. I did that. Uh, and I did that in less than two years. A lot of people will tell, tell you that, oh, you have to stay in the in a job for two years or so many years if you switch too much, it's not good. Really like I feel it's, while there are those good guidelines, it's really not um, like again, a make or break. You can define your own path and don't be, don't ever feel like, oh, you have to uh, stay in this because, uh, um, because it's not the right timeline, it's not two years, it's not worth it. You, if you get out and if you do better, those, if, if you do better in another role, that one year of growth really would serve you, which I think did when I switched, did for me when I switched to a different role and I really liked it. If I did it one year later, I would have lost that one year of growth, which I had in the second role. So, um, and that and then bring me to my last point here is life life balance it's not a it's not a typo there it's really not work life balance a lot of the time again once you go into the corporate this is again a very very overly high like hyper talked about term work life balance or the lack thereof of work life balance it's really like and i have stolen this from a talk from, by uh, Trevor Noah, uh, where he said it's really not li work life balance because it's not like rest of the time the life doesn't happen. Like life, you know, doesn't stop. So you should not um, be miserable at your job. Don't hate your job because most of like your awake hours, at least 50% of it, you would be spending doing that particular thing. So it is very important to not hit the work and it's also very important to not let the work consume your whole life um so remember that remember that there is always a balance it's oftentimes very hard to strike and uh, it's there is probably more common to not have a balance in corporate and even in my life right now and uh, periodically check in with you like whether you have that or not uh, and whether you would like that whether you would like where whether this is serving you or not serving you again everybody is slightly different so um, so think about that and be cognizant of that um, that life is happening with you uh, even while you are at work. So it should not be that oh, work is miserable, but it should not be like work is all that you have, like really like have life outside. It really helps um, in the long run. And uh, one really good advice I was given by a very senior uh, person in the industry when I was going to Intel, and I think like repeatedly I remind myself of this, is if you let, and this was kind of specific to Intel, but if you uh, let this company or the work um, 
take all your days and all your nights, it will happen. There is always more work to do at the end of the day. And there is like, if you do more, you are given more to do. Um, so remember that, remember that, um, yeah, remember that it will it will always be there. The work will always be there. And many times it's not that um, sort of detrimental if you stop and you come back the next day. Sometimes it's really productive. Sometimes if you are stuck with a problem, don't burn yourself out in trying to solve that problem. It's probably losing your creativity. If you stop and if you come back again the next day, refresh, rejuvenate yourself with doing other things that you like to do, it is going to help you. It's going to like probably like you solve it next morning even better. So um, remember that. Uh, and with that, I would say it's really a hike. It's really challenging at times, but it should be rewarding for you, the whole process, not just the end, but the process of hiking. Um, so yeah, initially it's it's very much like a hike, hike and I do like to hike. So I just kind of brought in the hike metaphor here. Test the waters. Sometimes you have to you know change your pace. You have to just, like see the weather, like feel the weather, learn the weather, um, all of that. Like it's a wholesome experience. It will be challenging, but it has to be uh, uh, rewarding for you. And uh, remember that. And um, it will hopefully it'll be a good journey for every one of you. Uh, with that, I would say good luck for everybody who is uh, kind of embarking on the on the journey to career uh, in industry or otherwise. Uh, and then uh, floor is open to questions. I know I spoke a lot. Uh, I didn't give you guys probably chance to even interrupt myself. So now is your time <laughs> to blast me with questions. And thank you again. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Krishna Karidi. I think, yeah, you've talked about a lot of points that at least I have been on some career development talks and they didn't really speak about those. So those were really useful. And yep, questions. I do have a couple, but if others have some, please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I have a question. Uh, so I uh, saw that you work in nanophotonics and uh, I myself uh, work in like cold atoms uh, integrated into nanophotonics and stuff like that. So uh, there are a lot of companies uh, that have come up in the past few years, like cold quanta and atom computing and stuff like that, which actually work on uh, using cold atoms for quantum computing and for quantum technologies, and also some nanophotonics companies like Xanadu, et cetera. So as someone in the industry, what do you think about these companies and uh, where do they stand in your opinion? Like, are they heading into the correct direction and uh, do you think they can be successful? Uh, good question. And I would say uh, that I don't have the full, uh, you know, exposure to answer that question for you because um, um, I don't work with nanophotonics anymore, <laughs> even though um, that was my area. Um, it, uh, right now, what I do in Intel is kind of stepped away from it. Um, so I can get you in touch with people who can answer this better for you, like who, who I know are working in very similar, uh, uh, my peers who are working in uh, the field uh, right now, and they might be able to like uh, uh, give you a better answer on where those companies are heading. I don't want to give my opinion here because I am just not, um, fully, you know, up to date with everything that is going on. So uh, thanks for that question. And I'll, I would look into it. But if you are interested, I can get you in touch with one of my very good friend who is working in um, uh, quantum computing and so on in industry. And I know that he looked at a lot of um, uh, different companies when he was just making the switch uh, very recently uh, into industry from academia. Um, and uh, you can you can talk to him and see um, if he has you know better inputs for you. Um, but um, I, I, the one thing I can tell you though is nanophotonics is really up and coming and a lot of money has been going into nanophotonics. So I think for small, like it's a good place to be in 
um, at this point where there's like a lot of funding in nanophotonics. Uh, so if that's that that's your area and that's where you like to work, um, um, uh, it's 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 a good spot. Uh, quantum computing is very up and coming, and you know it's going to be uh, the talk of the town for several several years to come. So again, a very good area to be in. Um, it's for specific companies. I'm sorry, I don't have the full yeah, that's uh, all right. that's all. this thing to give you uh, but yeah if you are interested hit me up later and i'll connect you to my friend who can uh, who can answer this for you sure and another question i had was uh, does intel have job roles that you know uh, uh, that uh, kind of uh, align with this kind of interest in like quantum technologies and nanophotonics and like uh, you know photonic technologies and stuff like that yeah they have so they have um, uh, photonic roles for sure uh, but more uh, towards silicon photonics and you know integrated right. optics is what uh, intel intel's um, forte is integrated technologies so they are into yeah. integrated photonics and there are a lot of roles in integrated photonics um, there would be research roles as well but there are a lot of like like engineer kind of roles as well um, mm -hmm. uh, and i did uh, i did go through some of the interviews for that and didn't quite work out for me for the timeline but yes they do have they have a whole like a whole organization called um, SPPD, Silicon Photonics Product uh, Development Group, uh, where uh, they, which is pretty much the org which does um, all the silicon, all the silicon photonic stuff, and they have a lot of photonics related role. Um, uh, it's based. Uh, they have a whole fab also that does all this stuff, and that's based up in New Mexico. But most of their um, engineer and, and development or research roles are, are in. Uh, uh, Santa Clara. I see. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. I had a quick question. Um, yeah. If other people don't, Obishik, did you want to ask anything? I yeah, saw you. Yeah. You can go ahead first. All right, all right. So, uh, like, hi, I'm Obishik. It was really a nice talk. Uh, like, you know about those things beforehand. And uh, like, uh, I really like the part where you said that we're uh, doing an offer where you sometimes can be pursued and sometimes can be pushed because uh, like I have felt something like that and it's really interesting to know to take a note on that. So uh, what I wanted to ask is like, so like most of us, like personally me, I have been like, uh, like been in academia since uh, for since like childhood and till 26th of year. So it's like uh, this. Uh, corporate world and the job industry is like uh, a whole new world for me. So, which brings a lot new perspective and also uh, it's a huge transition. So, did you feel like when you like switched from the academia to the industry, did you feel any kind of like that transition and how did you cope up with the professional world, the difference in the professional world? Like in PhD, you are very flexible with your with your schedules, with your deadlines and all. But uh, in the other hand, I don't feel like it's that much flexible. And how did your everyday life and your decision like uh, get uh, like depends upon that? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question. Good question. Um, I also was the same. Like I spent a lot of time studying and <laughs> did my master's before coming to PhD. I did PhD, so it was a really long uh, academic career. And then I didn't do a postdoc, but um, then I went into industry. So yeah, I did a lot long academic uh, journey before stepping into the whole industry uh, life. And um, yeah, they are very different. <laughs> They're very different. Uh, every company would be different, but let me answer from my perspective right because that's where uh, that's where I can give you some of uh, my experience so uh, yeah the transition is not easy don't think oh it's gonna be you know it's it's going to be different and to know go, to know that while going in that it's going to be different is going to serve you so know that it's going to be different the expectations are different like uh, like several things I said like uh, how things work is very different how you um, and to learn how things work is important and um, 
yeah, initially it would be, um, you, you might be like uh, you, flexibility. Yeah, one, one point that you, you mentioned is flexibility, not enough flexibility in, uh, in industry. Uh, that is very true. Uh, not enough flexibility in industry and um, you might be asked to do something in a in a certain like tight time zone and you nobody is really interested in the explanations of how you couldn't do it so all of that uh, all of that is true and all of that is real and uh, you are going to be able to navigate it um, as as you kind of you know go go through the process so uh, it's just it's just about experiencing the whole whole thing and not always is going to be easy like my initial experience with intel it was not very easy like i spent a few months after joining like really struggling to understand how things work how people work and why am i not being given the kind of opportunities i would like uh, why is this not enough and a lot of lot of questions i asked and um, it's real it's, it can happen but uh, the only thing uh, I would say that that will help you uh, try in navigating this is um, trying to learn the ropes as much as possible. Try to see if this is not working, what else can work? Can you set your expectations clear and be like, oh, you know, uh, tight timeline is okay, but if you give me a heads up, it would help. Like, just like bring in your um, bring in your thoughts also into the into the situations. Give give feedback, take feedback, but also give feedback. Um, if something is not working for you, you should say it. Um, not always it will be you know taken very positively, but you should you have to try. You have to put yourself out there. You have to. Um, uh, you have to do what you can you you basically you own your growth and your experience so you have to do whatever is in your power there will be some things and more things in the industry that are outside of your control um, but focus on what you can control focus on um, how you can um, you know make it an easier experience for you or better experience for you and say that out aloud don't say don't think that people are going to know people just don't have the time to think about you this is one thing that i learned like it's not like they're just insensitive they just don't have the bandwidth it's it's and so if you don't say something it will never come up especially the struggles that you are having um, and then if if you have tried all of that it's still not working and it's still not the thing that you know it's not going okay for you you find elsewhere you talk to other people see what else you can do a different team something maybe like don't don't be afraid to don't feel like oh not working oh, i'm stuck you are never stuck because you have you have so much experience you have a phd and you probably have done other things in your life you have so much good experience and you have so much um, sort of like um, under your sleeve that you can actually um, um, count on and you can actually go do other things like it, you are never stuck so never um, give that impression never feel that and like continuously keep learning and um, keep communicating communicating is important like it's it's really underrated but it's really important like if somebody I, I think that's that's like the most uh, important. I feel like even even the, like the transition there is there is the most difficult because you don't have to communicate so much with others and don't have to do so much people management in your PhD because you are you're you're your own boss. You're the thesis. You're your own boss of your thesis. So how you do your work, when you do it, it's all decided by, by you. But not in industry because you are you are doing with five other people and when they are doing it, how they are doing it, how they are communicating, all of that matters. And if that's not working, like, and there will be many, many situations and people really like their politics of different kinds that come up, all of that you'll learn. Just, just absorb things as much as you can and then um, try, to try to be clear in communicating with your peers and your managers as much as possible force yourself to do that i would say because it does not come naturally to do it it does not come naturally to say that hey this is not working for me can can we do something different but um you have to kind of force yourself to do that and then 
yeah, know that transition is only a phase. Uh, before you know it, you're going to be uh, inside and not in transition phase anymore. Yeah. Hopefully that that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I have one question and I think after that we will have to wrap up the meeting. So um, my question is, how does evaluation in the industry work? How often are employees evaluated and sort of, you know, how do we get to know how we are doing? Yeah, uh, so I think uh, uh, every company has a different way of evaluating like formally, um, I would say the bigger companies, as much as I know, uh, the, they do it formally every quarter. A quarter is sort of like a thing for most tech companies because earnings, everything like the business go by quarter. So everything kind of has to go by quarter. So at least once a quarter, you are formally in most cases being evaluated. There is one major one in annual. So you're also being evaluated annually, but all that matters less. What matters more is your weekly or bi-weekly evaluations with your manager or your immediate, uh, like the person you report to. Cause uh, that's something that you do a lot more, like depending on your manager in the beginning, they might do like all the time, like um, every week as you get more experience they might like reduce the frequency of doing it uh, but yeah evaluating evaluations with your manager that matters the most because it's not like um, even though you're doing it quarterly um, uh, even more than that especially for you to get feedback on how you're doing utilize your constant um, communications with your manager uh, uh, and see if you're on track, if you're on meeting the expectations, how you can change your expectations. And a lot of the companies have very good system of, you know, making this like very um, um, sort of systematic. Uh, some other companies may not have it as systematic, but uh, to have this in your, ha to have to do this with your manager is important. To document as much as you can is very important because nobody's going to remember it at the uh, end of the quarter. So more, more you can document, uh, better in the, in the beginning. Also gives you that kind of sense that, oh, I have done so much. So what I had to do initially in my previous team was send out a weekly report of what I have done. And um, that sort of a weekly assessment. A lot of the teams still do it, like even for our senior engineers, they do it. So um, that's that sort of documentation really helps because even when you are writing at the end of the quarter what you have done you don't have to rack your brain you can um you can go through all the previous documentations that you have seen to do what you have done so evaluations um can be uh, can be as often as you want and if you think that you're not getting enough evaluations or not enough feedback that is something to take up with your manager for sure, like, hey, can I, can we chat? Most of the time, managers are pretty open doors and not as formal as professors. I would say the relationship with your manager. So um, uh, they're more peer level than, you know, really big out of the outwardly structures. So uh, the more you communicate, the better and more you document is better. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Can I just ask one question real quick? I yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for the talk. It was really insightful. You did mention about searching for, uh, trying to think about transitioning to the industry and the sooner you start, the better it is. My question is that, can you quantify as to when should a student start thinking about a job in the industry, provided the student has made up his mind not to stay in academia? Would it be before they even start graduate school? Would it be when they select a graduate mentor or would it be sometime during the time between the PhD or during the PhD? Uh, I would say whenever you decide, like I said, earlier the better. I don't think you need to know it before you select the advisor. Because uh, I know that some advisors be like, oh, they're more, um, you know, their, their alumni are more academia oriented. Uh, versus I, my own advisor group is the same, like most of my uh, grad school peers are in academia. 
so but if you know it i think i knew it in parts before even i went into grad school like in phd that i probably don't see myself into uh, in in an academic career that helped me in certain way like some professors would like you to have that clarity once you, when you join them meaning i was definitely asked when i i went and like you know tried to work with different professors are you going into industry are you looking to go into industry or are you looking into going to academia because especially in science phd's the phd itself might look kind of different based on where you want to go so if you do know that it does help you in that sense but i don't think you have to know it you can decide it throughout like during your phd based on your experience and um, as long as you know by fourth third year i think that's good because uh, you can start building because in academia like if you do decide to go into academia you need to make a lot of connections and you can start investing in making those connections early if you um if you know that early like you're going into conferences you should talk to other professors like really force yourself to do that so those kind of things really help if you are um, if you know that early uh, in, in like for industry also like if you actually meet peers like conferences have also industries you can go talk to them and like put yourself out there to like have some kind of conversation all those help but it's not they're not like um, absolute must haves so as long as you know before like the end end of your phd i think you're good don't don't pressurize yourself like oh i have to know at the very beginning no i don't think so that's okay. thank you so much yeah yeah all right so the meeting is also going to get over in 4 minutes so if you guys please want to join me in thanking krishna kolidi for this wonderful and insightful talk today um thank you so much hopefully we can have you again later for maybe other yeah. talks yep and yeah yeah and if you guys have uh, any other questions if you need any other help um, do not hesitate uh, to reach out uh, yeah so uh, and uh, i have even if i can't answer your questions directly i can connect you to other peers and other friends it's also it it really also helps and we i know we wanted to do something like this for puts to have an alumni directory of sorts so that people um, you know get to know about the alumni so because uh, uh, that kind of thing can help and i know a lot of people in puts alumni is in our peers that are in different fields and they can all help in different ways and people are uh, people are um, most of the time willing to help so don't ever feel like um intimidated to ask for help or ask for questions ask for um ask for referral or ask for any any kinds of connection so it's always good and it's always should reach out and uh, see where that takes you that's what um i would like to say in uh, conclusion so yeah do reach out if you have any more questions or anything else later and thank you again for giving me the uh the opportunity to share my insights Uh, it was a nice experience for me also hopefully you all got something to take away from this um yeah um, thanks a lot angana and thanks a lot thank to you put. thank you thank you for being here with us today we wish you all the best for your journey in intel and wherever you go next and thank yeah you, thank you yeah hopefully you can you. visit us at purdue if you find the time to at some point <laughs> yeah yeah plan to at some point uh, let's see if it happens this year yeah awesome okay with that um thank you and have a great afternoon and great rest of your weekend everybody and bye yeah. thank, thank you. you so much bye yeah bye